So far in this presentation, we've covered the basic anatomy of the wrist and hand, the ways of assessing using a look, feel and move approach, as well as looking at some of the red flags, as well as the systemic factors that can affect wrist and hands. In addition, we've gone through some rehabilitation programmes for systematic factors. And uh, before we move on to more of the musculoskeletal and biomechanical problems of the wrist and hand, what I'd like to go through is some useful objective markers that can augment our assessment in the clinical setting. So for some of these, you'll need equipment, and uh, really it depends on your role, but some of them are, are useful, and, and a really good place to start is, is with a functional score. So there's tons of functional scores out there, but something that I find quick, easy, and reproducible for myself is the quick dash score. It, it, it takes a couple of minutes, and it gives you a really good indication of where someone is, and you can track their improvement or regression over a period of time through doing this. So if I've got a patient who's got a complex hand problem, it may be the first thing I do is do the quick dash score, but I'll be careful not to do it every single session. It's something that I'll probably do on the first session, set them up on some rehab, maybe see them every couple of weeks for six weeks, and then at six weeks I might revisit this and revisit the objective markers to see whether how they're objective scores and their functional scores match against what they're saying to me. And quite often I have patients who say, oh, I don't feel any better. But I'll say to them, well, your quick dash score of disability has improved from 70 out of 100 to 30 out of 100. So that would tell me that although you don't feel better today, things are improving. Also, the other objective markers can be a, a useful way of, of negotiating that, that, that process with your patients. I'd recommend that all clinics have a, uh, have a grip dynamometer if they're going to be seeing wrist and hands, just because it's so easy and it's versatile, it can be used for a few things. So here's Sam using the grip tester. Now with it, I get him to hold it so it's down by the side of his body. At one level, what it does is produce a reading of the amount of gross grip strength that the, that the patient has. However, I use it as well to have an impression of their symptoms. So what I mean by this is, as they're doing it, I ask them to build up the strength, and I look for a ratio of three repetitions. So if the person squeezes three times, then I take an average of the, of the three, so that we've got a, we haven't got one freak amount. Also, if we do repeat a testing, so we test on three times, it can give me information that the patient has got a fatigue element. So if they start off by pushing through the pain barrier and getting 40 kilograms of grip strength, but then the next one, they can't do that and they're at 20, and then the next one, they're at 10, that tells me that there's more irritability in that area, and that can be clinically useful. So when I'm taking this test, we go left hand squeeze, right hand squeeze, and do that three times. I'm also asking my patients to report on pain with it. So a lot of people say that you should look at pain-free grip strength for tennis elbows, the amount of grip that you can get without pain. Now with the wrist and hand, I tend not to use the grip dynamometers in a pain-free way, but I'll record it. So if someone can squeeze 40 kilograms, but it's a 5 out of 10 pain, that's interesting to me, just as if they go through that treatment and they never get any stronger so they stay at the 40 kilograms but that pain reduces as they go through and I, I find that useful. Also I don't find that people hurt themselves when they're doing this pain, painful grip strength. The, the body seems to stop you before you push through to damage and this is borne out by the work through my, my good friend and colleague when I was with GB Boxing, uh, Ian Gatt and, and he was uh, really useful in bringing in objective marking in markers into our treatment of the boxes um, and things that we do on a daily basis would be to grip test the athletes. Now it's interesting because there's a normal difference between dominant and non-dominant side that we found with these boxes of between 16 and 15 percent. So if you're getting people who are slightly uneven side on side that's completely fine and nothing to worry about. However if there is a big difference 
between left and right sided gripping and it's more than 50%, this indicates that there's a fracture or a dislocation, so an intra-articular injury. And that's a red flag. So you can use this in a way to diagnose a red flag pathology and certainly help you inform the escalation to diagnostics. Another really nice way of using your grip dynamometer is to uh, reverse the handle so that you can use it in a push-off test way. And this is more functional for, for, for perhaps your older population who struggle to get out of the bath or, or struggle when they're pushing themselves up off a chair. Now this has some evidence for it and uh, the person who invented it uh, was uh, Vincent was the person who validated the study and he found it was excellent. And then it was revalidated by a colleague of his and it seemed that they were quite upset that you know, it had to be revalidated. So it's useful for identifying especially injuries to the TFCC or ulnar-sided uh, injuries. And you can see Sam performing it here. So you need a stable surface, it's held behind you and you're basically lowering your hand onto the dynamometer and comparing that left and right. Again, I make a note of the pain and I also do it three times and work out the ratio to set a baseline. Another marker, which is really easy to do, is your weight, uh, weighing scale test. And this is really nice. And there is an article that looked at this in terms of its clinical utility, but I've not been able to find it. But it's, it's a really simple test and the only thing you need is, is a simple weighing scale. So the weighing scale's held at waist height on a table and you push the weight through. Again, a really nice way to be able to track your patient's progress. And you know people who are struggling following immobilisation or they're, they've maybe had a fracture and they're recovering um, but they're wanting to get back to doing more active things such as press-ups or burpees. A good way of judging that is by using this weight, weight, weight and scale test in that if they can only push on 10 kilograms without pain, you know that they shouldn't be trying to do their press-ups at the moment. And it's a really nice way of following those people through. Finally, I also recommend the use of a, of a little pinch dynamometer. And this is really nice to use for two of the most functional grips that we have in the thumb. So one of those is key grip, one of them is pinch grip. Now, there's over 16 types of different grip in our hands, but these are the main ones that we use functionally. And, and again, you need a bit of special gear for this, but if you're looking to become research active or you're looking to do your audits, I'd say it's money well spent to get a pinch dynamometer as well as a gross grip dynamometer. And I'd recommend you take your bathroom scales to clinic with you so that you can uh, set some markers there.